Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. We have Harley Schlanger and an incredibly long list of amazing and shocking news going on. The first uh, attempt to, uh, to recall a governor has failed up in uh, Wisconsin. We have a situation where Spain is being left literally with no life preservers thrown over the side by Europeans saying, well, go get the money yourself, and they can't get credit. We have uh, the situation where none of the nations are dealing with a disaster in Japan, which I think is going to be the fulcrum point of the summer. And I don't see any way that Europe is going to piece this mess together. It's like Humpty Dumpty. Um, and, of course, lately we're, we're dealing with some strange results in elections, too, and corruption. Let's start from the top about all of the warnings about war, et cetera, and economic chaos. Things are really hopping, aren't they? Oh, things are, are quite wild because they have one meeting after another where they're trying to come up with a plan to deal with the the crisis. And, of course, they're not really dealing with the crisis. They're, they're circle, circling around it, you might say. Yeah, it's a good one. It's like the vulture is circling around the dead prey to make sure it doesn't twitch. Yeah, and you, you've got the, if you look at the, from the top down, Take the election, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the issue of Spain that you brought up. Uh, Spain, they're reevaluating every few hours how much is actually owed on the Spanish debt. And it's sort of like J.P. Morgan Chase. First they said $2 billion, then $3 billion, then $5 billion, then no one knows how many billion. Spain, they initially said a month ago that it's $100 billion that they're going to need to recapitalize the banks. That's euros, so that's about 125 billion euros, or dollars, rather. Then they said all of a sudden 200, then 300. And then in one week it went from 300 to 350 to 400 to 450. They're now saying 475 billion euros just to get the banks through a couple of months. And Ackermann, the former head of Deutsche Bank and a top advisor to the uh, German government, Merkel, came out and said, look, we have 750 billion euros between the European Financial Stability Fund and the European Stability Mechanism to draw on for bailouts. That should last a few months. So well, 750 but, but billion. The, one of the key and, issues that I think we need to focus on is the Vega, Bank Santander that actually is one of the largest of the inter-alpha group that's charting with the British. And this is one of the fulcrum points of how this whole house of cards is going to come down, isn't it? Exactly. Santander is one of the crown jewels of what's called the inter-alpha group, which is the modern British Empire Rothschild banking network. And Santander has its money primarily in, uh, uh, I guess you would say, uh, well, it, it was in real estate, and they lost everything. Right. They just lost everything. And so they're sitting there with uh, just billions going, evaporating daily. And their hope is that they're going to come up with a plan to um, bail it out. And now they're saying what's needed is a, a banking plan that would be a bank for Europe, like the FDIC. Now, this isn't going to work. They're also saying that Germany, as the one country that has money, should come up with the funds to bail out every single uh, bank that's in trouble. And that's not going to fly either. No. So now you have a situation where some, bank, some countries are being told, you bail out the banks or we're going to let you collapse. Uh, now, the Spanish government which has to bail out banks plus the government plus the regional governments they're basically playing a chicken game they're saying you have to give us the money first and we're not going to go with the greece policy of austerity well one of the problems with so spain is that each of the regions is financially autonomous in many ways too so although they have to bail them out they don't have control over these regions of spain they're almost like like independent provinces of spain they're almost like independent sub countries but ultimately, that's true. But ultimately, the question is, who's going to be stuck holding the bag with the bailout? I like the uh, comment from uh, Merkel, and it was correct, that uh, she says, what do you want, more Europe or more German money? <laughs> well, and Merkel also said something similar to Putin. You know, Putin was in Germany the other day, and what 
Putin and Merkel talked about is why Germany shouldn't bail up bail out the euro by itself. And remember Putin's comment, why should we buy your spoiled food? It will just give us stomach aches. Merkel said, why should we buy bits of your ruined banks? So I think uh, that, that Merkel and uh, Putin had a somewhat agreement on that question. Now, also, this is very important. Uh, there was a Euro-Russia summit, and the Europeans came there saying Russia has to drop its opposition to an invasion of Syria. And the Russians said, we will not allow a UN security resolution for a foreign intervention in Syria. And we think it's up to the Syrian people to decide who their ruler should be. Then secondly, they were told that they should privatize their gas company, Gazprom, to use the U.S. model of separating production from transportation from sales. And the Russians said, have you guys forgotten about Enron? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because that was the Enron model. Right. You remember that the Enron model was that you separate these things. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, <laughs> the, the Russians, are, they're not stupid. Uh, that's the firing of Kudrev a few months ago, ago before the elections, uh, by Medvedev, which is totally in collaboration with with uh, Mr. Putin, was engineered to dissect away the the British attempt to force the Russians to buy European sovereign debt. And, and that's uh, that, why, and also to use the cash they have from their gas deliveries to bail out Europe. And what Putin said is that we want to have a long-term agreement to have a stable, consistent supply of gas from Russia to Europe at market prices. And in return, we want you to allow us to invest the proceeds of that as we see fit for developing a Russian economy for the future. And we're not going to allow you to dictate to us what kind of banking system we're going to have. Yeah. So it was about as clearly stated as it could be by Putin. And so you have this stalemate now. You have the European countries like Greece, Italy, and Spain who are now bluffing. They're telling the euro, well, we can always leave if you don't bail us out. And the Europeans are saying, well, we'll let you leave unless you accept our bailout terms. No one's going to leave, and no one's going to let them leave, because the whole banking system is intertwined. The, what they're negotiating now is what they're going to get for giving up their sovereignty. And that's the problem in Europe. You have parliamentary systems that are largely controlled by bureaucrats in Brussels and bankers in London. Now, if the Spanish want to do something about the crisis... They should say Santander is not really a Spanish bank, it's a British bank, and we're going to let you and the city of London eat the $1.3 trillion of bad assets that we know are on the books of Banco Santander. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they, you don't they, have to bluff, just do that. Yeah. Now, what's going to happen, I think, is the... Uh, we even have the Canadian Prime Minister says uh, his, his comment at the uh, emergency G7 uh, phone, if you want to call it summit, which they had over the last few days. He said basically we're running out of runway. <laughs> so, uh, which I think was very uh, appropriate Canadian style comment. It's like, hey, we're running out of runway here. In other words, uh, the whole banking system is collapsing, and I think it's actually by design. I think they want to create a whole new banking order where they pour in so much money into the banking establishment, which is, by the way, taking that money, and they're not putting it out to credit to build real infrastructure or business or like the NAWAPA project or pouring it back into small and medium businesses. No, they're tightening it up. What they're doing is they're speculating on commodities like food, and uh, this is going nowhere. Eventually, and this is what's also happening in China, it's going to collapse their economy. And the Chinese are very nervous about what's going on because they know a major downturn will cause a revolution in China. Yeah, we're facing a lot of that. All across the world you have that problem. Yeah, it's not good. Back in a moment with more with Harley Schlanger and LaRouche Foundation. That's L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E-P-A-C dot com and the EIR Executive Intelligence Review. LaRouche, P-U-B dot com. Back in a moment with Harley. Welcome back. 
Welcome back, and we have Harley Schlanger on uh, talking about some major, major issues. Just want to run down through some of these top issues and then maybe see which one you want to run with first. Okay. Uh, the Russia s- slate makes the election primaries process an instrument to save the U.S., and, of course, we have the recent situation where Diane Sayre, uh, her four-minute video, I had a look at that this morning. That's pretty remarkable. Keisha Rogers' victory, of course, invigorates the drive against Obama to impeach him, which I think we need to impeach before the election, because here's what I suspect, and I'm going to repeat this scenario so people will get an idea. And they won't repeat it elsewhere and say, Digo, you took it from somebody else. This is what I think is likely to happen in the current trajectory. It doesn't mean it's absolute. It just means this is where we're going at the moment. But I think that you're going to see the Europe continue to struggle and futz and fiddle around the end of the June. Uh, June 28th, 29th, they're going to have a meeting. Uh, they're having a G20 meeting, I think, in the middle of the month. They had a G7 meeting by phone just the other day. Um, the real fulcrum factor is going to be Japan. When Japan has a major radiation release, they're going to be an evacuation, at least a part of northern Tokyo. Kyoto was offered to already be the alternative capital and start moving the capital from Tokyo to, to Kyoto. I think uh, China and Japan, when it crashes, which is coming midsummer, uh, we're going to have a massive retraction of credit, which would have gone to Europe because it's the second largest creditor after China. China, by the way, isn't very keen on buying up more bad debt because of the kind of terms they're offering China. The Chinese feel they have a lot of leverage, which, to be honest with you, they don't. But uh, what I think is going to happen is you're going to start, you'll see Europe crash uh, by later this summer, and you'll see a bank holiday in America after the British banking system and the five major U.S. banks that are tied to it crash. And Obama will try to ride in on the chaos by a squeaker because of two things. Firstly, Mitt Romney has to get the Hispanic vote. He's lagging 30% on that. And a lot of Republican uh, governors have passed laws against, quote, Hispanic populations and workers who could work here. To be honest with you, I don't have a problem with people that can get in here and validly provide work to the area that are not criminals. We have a lot of people even that serve military service and they're criminals. They're going to become gang leaders in Los Angeles and other cities like Phoenix. I think we have a real big problem with... uh, uh, the fact that Obama has real issues with most of his so-called base, he tried to re-energize it with the gay and lesbian issue, with the marriage issue, which shows how low he'll go. Actually, you know, on, the, on the gay and lesbian thing for Obama, that's a fundraising thing. Most exactly. of his money now is coming from venture capitalists, from Hollywood, from uh, the wealthy gay networks, and he's still getting a lot from uh, Wall Street, even though Romney's getting a lot from Wall Street. Yeah, Romney's got more money from Wall Street, but here's the other issue I think is going to happen. Obama uh, has, has tried to rebuild his base. Mitt Romney hasn't gotten his stride yet. The Christian right still is nervous about uh, Mitt Romney. I have known Mormons for many years. In many ways, they're more conservative than so-called Christians. Uh, and uh, they're not Christians, by any means, they're cults, but they're more conservative. And the fact is that Mitt Romney supported uh, gay and lesbian marriage in Massachusetts. He supported $50 free abortions. He may say he's changed. I don't buy it. I don't see any repentance on his face. I don't see him actually talking about doing a personhood issue uh, challenge in the Supreme Court. I don't see anything. But we do have four reasons why. We have a major crisis coming. And there are four elderly judges about to either pass on to the next world or become so demented that they can't function in the Supreme Court. And if we get Obama back in, those four Supreme Court justices will most likely be replaced by none other than the Obaminator. And that will permanently change the direction of American culture and destroy America as a republic. Well, I so, personally uh, think we have about seven senile judges, some of whom are younger and shouldn't be on the court either. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the ones that are in their late 70s that are, you can pretty well guarantee that, that, that their few last good functioning neurons are ready to take a permanent vacation. But I'll tell you, that on the, on the, rather than look at a scenario as to what's going to happen, we can take a look at what's actually happening right now because the two okay. things... It's a good look at both of them, though. It's a, that way you get, you've got a trajectory... And then you've got to say, okay, here's what we can do to stop this from hitting the wall. Sure, sure. But what I'm saying is that immediately the financial situation is the, the crisis is so far advanced that you can't project what it's going to look like in November from where we are now because there's liable to be shocks over the next couple of months that we, you know, we've already seen almost every government in Europe brought down. And the idea that just because we have a different system, we, we, we won't have a president brought down. If the euro goes and the inter-alpha group goes, 
this will affect banks in the United States, especially the money center banks, the Goldman Sachs, the J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Citibank. They're already all in big trouble. But if you have a serious tanking of the U.S. banking system, which, which, that will create a, a downward spin on everything that will make it impossible for Obama to win the election. Now, Democrats, and I, I talked to leading Democrats across the country, they're already saying, is there some other option? Now, let me just give you an example of something that happened this last weekend. In uh, Virginia, there was a state Democratic convention. Now, usually in a presidential year, I know you know this, Dr. Bill, when you have a state Democratic convention and you've got a Democratic candidate for president, it's a big pep rally for the candidate. Obama's name was hardly mentioned at the Virginia Democratic Convention. Instead, they were uh, praising retiring Senator Jim Webb. Now, what has Webb done? He's introduced a bill that would outlaw what Obama's trying to do with these interventions in foreign countries without congressional approval. So this was an anti-Obama crowd. In Massachusetts, where twice before they, they voted against the Glass-Steagall bill at the Massachusetts Democratic Convention, this time the leading candidate in Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, her leading issue is Glass-Steagall. And again, Obama was not even mentioned by the Massachusetts Democrats because he opposes Glass-Steagall. And then in Washington state, Maria Cantwell, who was the co-sponsor with John McCain of the Glass-Steagall bill in the U.S. Senate in 2009, uh, when Cantwell spoke and mentioned Glass-Steagall, there was the loudest, most prolonged applause of the whole convention. So here are three Democratic Party conventions with no Obama. Then look at yesterday, two elections stand out, and we can talk about Wisconsin later. But in New Jersey, there was a district where you had two incumbent Democrats who were redistricted, so they ran against each other. One was supported by the White House and Obama. Obama sent Axelrod up there. He did a photo op with the candidate, a man named Rothman. The other candidate, Pascarell, was supported by Bill Clinton. Which one do you think won? Huh. The Clinton guy won almost two to one. Then in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, you had the funny race of Sherman versus Berman. Again, two incumbent Democrats redistricted out, so they ran against each other. Obama supported Howard Berman, who's one of the most liberal uh, congressmen in, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, Clinton supported Brad Sherman, and Clinton's candidate won by 10%. Then you take Wisconsin, and I don't care how they try to spin it, this was a kick in the teeth to Obama. It's not that I support what Scott Walker's doing. It's just that nobody really opposed it effectively. It's not a union issue. It's really an issue of whether we're going to have economic growth or whether we're going to go to fascist austerity and who's going to administer the austerity. Exactly. Yeah, those are excellent points. Back in a moment with Har Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Foundation. L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E-P-A-C dot com. Just a moment. Welcome back, and uh, Harley, let's uh, touch on some of these other important topics. Well, let, me, um, let me just finish the point I, uh, before the break. What sure. I was getting at is that there's enough evidence that, the, as you said earlier, the traditional Democratic constituencies are running away from the president. Uh, he still has the money, he still has the office, and he still has the knuckle breakers on his side, the, the right. axle rods and people like that. But if they can't get votes then the Democrats in the Senate have already decided they want to be distant from him. Well, they also, have the, uh, they, they also have the ability to steal Lisa Persange of the electoral vote through these electronic voting machines. And um, we have, you know, ACORN is behind them, and they're another corrupt organization that is right in the back pocket, and they're paid monies that are basically are coming, you know, they're, they're a very illegal organization. Well, ACORN is a Soros front. So exactly. I put so. the money in the acorn in uh, 2008 to flood the, the uh, caucuses to win 
the Democratic nomination for Obama, who is the choice of Soros. That's why we call him the $2 billion man, not, not like Lee Majors, the $6 million man we used to watch many years ago. It was made bionic. We have the bionic president. I call it uh, Obama Nokio. And, of course, talking about bionics, we talk about the fact that uh, we're not dealing with the fact that we're going to have a shortage of corn. That issue came up. Uh, now new alliances between Russia and China, partly probably pro propelled forward by the missile defense issue, and Putin continues warnings. And, uh, you know, let's touch on some of these issues, too. Well, I, I, I'll tell you something that just came out uh, this since we talked last Wednesday. Uh, Susan Rice who is a quite literally insane woman, who's the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, she gave a speech after the Russians said last week they would not, they would continue to veto any intervention into Syria. So she said, well, then we're not going to, we should go outside of the U.N. to launch an attack to overthrow Assad. She said that as the official representative of the U.S. government. And the Russians said, what are you talking about? That would be a violation of international law. And she said, no, you're violating international law by not joining in to get Assad out of office. So today the deputy Russian foreign minister put out a statement on Putin's behalf saying that Russia will continue to oppose any effort to have a foreign intervention into Syria, will use their veto to make sure the UN Security Council does not allow that, and third, said that it is up to the people of Syria to decide who their leader is, not people in Western governments. Right. Now, this was about as clear as you could be. Meanwhile, Hollande, the new French president, is, is proving to be a lot like Sarkozy on this. He and Obama are coordinating, trying to figure out a way to get around the Russian-Chinese veto at the U.N., and the Russians and the Chinese are vetoing it because they know this has nothing to do with Assad and Syria. If the U.S. was really concerned about human rights violations in Syria, why are we talking about arming the al-Qaeda terrorists who are conducting bombings and random terror attacks against soldiers and police in Syria? And we know that, in fact, Hula, uh, the Hula massacre, was primarily carried out by these al-Qaeda terrorists that we've armed and supported politically and in the, the lame-brain media in the West. Well, then the BBC put up a picture which supposedly was the dead children in Hula, only it turned out to be a picture from Baghdad from 2003. Small error, hey? What do you think? Small error, yeah. And, it's you know, so disgusting the media thinks we're all a bunch of idiots that we're just going to accept this and not fact check. And the fact is, we know that Syria is being dismantled because the West says we want to get at the at Iran, and what's really rising, this is the driving influence of the whole thing, that's why we call the war in Iraq, the Gulf War One and Two, is an oil war. They discovered, now, oh my gosh, it's so surprising, they have like eight times as much oil as Saudi Arabia in just northern Iraq in media, and the Iranians have probably a lot more undiscovered oil too, so as the oil starts to, to run out in Saudi Arabia and these other southern Sunni countries that are the allies of the West, they want to take it over, and Russia says, no, you're not going to do this. And, of course, well, they don't I like the idea that the that even Turkey is making further alliances. They just finished the pipeline a month ago, roughly a month and a half ago, to Turkey all the way from Iran, and a pipeline from Iran all the way to Pakistan. And, of course, well, this enrages right. the West. Just after our Secretary of State was in uh, Azerbaijan, there was a, a conflict at the border of Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, five Azerbaijan soldiers and three Armenian soldiers were killed in the firefight. And the strategy of the British, which Hillary Clinton at this point is, is carrying out, their strategy is to create as many wars as possible surrounding Russia. And then if Russia tries to do anything about it, use the missile defense, the so-called missile defense units against them. Now, this is why what LaRouche keeps saying is that the real issue here is the British Empire trying to defend their collapsed banking system by forcing Russia and China, or giving Russia and China no alternative but to join in and help the bailout. Now, as I said at the beginning of the program, the former head of Deutsche Bank, who's a leading advisor to the German government, said they need 750 billion euros to get through July. Now, what kind of a business plan is that? 
That's like pouring blood into a patient that's got, that's like, it's like uh, putting IVs in every limb and a central IV line, trying to pour in fluids in a person that's bleeding to death because they get multiple gunshot wounds and no one's putting pressure on the wound or even uh, scheduling the operating room. Yeah, and it's crazy. It's like uh, this is a guaranteed disaster, and it's guaranteed to also suck all of Europe, including Germany, into a chasm that they can never get out of. And many of these countries have no other reserve currency, so they can't, like in Greece, people are running from hospital to hospital trying to get emergency medicine because they've got cancer, they've got heart disease. People literally, as we speak today, are dying in Greece and committing suicide, and this is contagion is going to spread. And it's happening because... Their last elected government, which said they would protect the people, instead turned their backs on the people of Greece to sign a deal when they were being blackmailed by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the European Union, and the European Central Bank. Now, today, the European Central Bank and the European Union last night had a European Finance Minister's meeting. And what they proposed is one bank for Europe and no government can go against the prescriptions from that bank, which means the government of Germany or the government of, of Portugal would not be able to pass a budget unless it went through the bank, the European bank. In other words, you can't even decide your own spending. This is the end of the idea of national sovereignty, if it's accepted. Now, on Saturday, Obama... Hollande of France and Mario Monti, formerly of Goldman Sachs, now the imposed dictator of Italy, the three of them talked to Thatcher, I'm sorry, to uh, Merkel for three hours and repeatedly said to Merkel, you have to accept the bailout. And Merkel kept saying no. And so you have a situation where there's unbearable pressure being put on Germany to capitulate. Now Merkel knows if she gives in, her government's finished. But then you have George Soros, who said, look, Germany has three months. In three months, their economy is going to start going south because of the overall euro crisis. So if they want a bigger bailout in three months, they should let it just do what they're doing, or else they should do the bailout now. And he said if they wait three months, they won't be able to save the German economy either. So this is the kind of blackmail that the speculators and the hedge fund operators and the private equity operators are putting on national governments. This is and, a similar scheme point, we did on Britain uh, years ago when he bagged a billion dollars in one day, George Soros did. And that's how he bankrupted uh, Thailand and uh, Malaysia, not Malaysia, uh, uh, Indonesia a few years ago. Look, Soros is a swindler, but he's a swindler who's directed by the same group that runs the Banco Santander and the Inner Alpha Group. It's a small group of bankers who are going to loot and loot and loot until the patient's dead, and then they're going to look for the next thing to loot. Yeah, well, I think, unfortunately, it's like when the lion kills the last wildebeest, he's looking, smacking his chips and saying, I guess we've got to, we've got to change our diet to eat vultures. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty bad, isn't it? Back in yep. a moment. Of course, uh, Harley. So, taking this all together, I, it looks like there's gathering momentum to get Glass-Steagall passed. And by the way, this is crossing both parties. One of the things about the, uh, uh, the little video this morning that I had a look at through the website, uh, it indicates that, that both parties have people that are kind of leaving, even for, including the, the Reform Party candidates or now the Tea Party uh, people that are in the Democratic Party, people in the Republican, they're all saying, starting to cry for a Glass-Steagall firewall between speculative banking and the real economy. Even Cy Harden of Forbes magazine said we need Glass-Steagall. So when Forbes magazine is calling for Glass-Steagall, you know it's crossed over from being a so-called liberal democratic issue. Yeah. Uh, look, Senator Richard Shelby is a key person. If, if any of your listeners live in Alabama, Senator Shelby knows the corruption of the Wall Street banks, and he's spoken privately about Glass-Steagall. He needs to come on the record. We need a Senate bill. Uh, John McCain, 
who, uh, despite his cheerleading of a war in Syria and his complete insanity on, on these kinds of issues, McCain at least recognizes that Wall Street went wild. And, you know, he should know this from his old friend Charles Keating, who he nearly got in trouble with for helping back in the 80s when Keating was running a junk bond scam at Lincoln Savings. So McCain has called for Glass-Steagall. Uh, there are 63 members of the House of Representatives, including, I think, four Republicans, who have uh, supported H.R. 1489. Now, what LaRouche says is, here's the issue. A lot of people say, well, Glass-Steagall wouldn't have stopped the Lehman collapse. Now, by itself, that's true, but it would have stopped the bailout, which followed in September 2008. With Glass-Steagall, you never would have had the bailout. But if you have a real Glass-Steagall, then you're also going to have to repeal things like the Commodities Future Modernization Act, which followed Glass-Steagall with a Phil Graham-directed, Greenspan-directed, complete deregulation of derivatives markets. Now, these should be regulated. As it is now, someone from Morgan Stanley can, can sit in their office and come up with a connection between the price of seashells in South Africa and uh, women's undergarments in Paris and write a derivative against it and sell it and buy it and sell it many times over. Well, I think what's also we're seeing is derivatives of derivatives. And this is a principle in mathematics that is really crazy, which means we don't really realize just how much debt is out there. Nobody can actually come up with a number even within a quadrillion dollars of how much debt's out there. That's what's disturbing. No, and they call it rocket scientists because some of the people who do this are called quants, which means quantified analysis. But what they do, really what they're doing, and if you read, there's a book that's out there called Quants, and it describes that most of the guys who went to the hedge funds with their formulas got their inspiration from studying card counting and similar things regarding probabilities in Las Vegas. And that's all it is. It's, it's coming up with formulas for uh, recurring phenomena that will give you a, a one penny or two penny margin if you move quickly enough and tie that to something of no underlying value and you come up with a bet against it. That's all derivatives are. They're, they are bets against bets and they have these things called CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, which are tranches of derivatives which are completely unregulated, and, and you're absolutely right. If you talk to a derivatives dealer and you say, what is represented by this million-dollar position I just took on a derivative, they'll talk like they know, but ultimately they'll say they don't know. It was sold by a friend who sold it to another friend at another firm who then uh, cut it in half and, and gave you a share in it. It would, it would now, always be like sitting on, uh, on a television video poker game where trillions of dollars are involved and the public is already voting about how people are going to play cards in a poker game in Las Vegas. So in other it, words, it it's, is like that. It, it's, it's, it's really voting, it's literally, literally a Ponzi scheme on a Ponzi scheme. It's just, it's mind-boggling that this is even allowed. See, the old days when the numbers racket was run in uh, ghetto neighborhoods, whether they were Italian, Jewish, black, that was legitimate compared to a derivatives operation. Right. And instead of a local enforcer named Three Fingers Louie, you've got now the SEC and you've got the Wall Street Journal and others running cover for these corrupt, crooked operations. And you've got the President of the United States who's praising the risk who praises Jamie Dimon as a good man. And, and Mitt Romney learned the same thing with Bain Capital. Although I have to say, Bain Capital is a penny-ante operation compared to the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. So you see what a hypocrite Obama is, praising J.P. Morgan Chase and attacking Bain Capital. It's the same game. Yeah, it's pretty insane. The, um, the, the biggest risk right now I think we're going to have is all of this is also raising the price of food worldwide and we're heading toward a call of world food crisis the Gobi Desert in China is expanding they're buying up uh, land all over the place the Japanese are now setting up rice crops in northern Australia they're buying the Chinese are buying up land everywhere in farms including in America most people aren't aware of this but a lot of Chinese investors as arms of the PLA are actually buying up farmland in Mexico South America Australia Africa and here right in America trying to buy farms but thank God have, for the moment 
for the moment, the crops, the rice crop is not doing badly globally. If the rice crop were to be hit by uh, drought in India or bad storms in Malaysia or China, you would have mass starvation uh, by this summer. By the end of the summer. What I've heard is that the, the corn crop is actually uh, is actually short, and they're already canceling orders now. Well, and, and the problem is a lot of the corn crop is going to this scam called ethanol, yeah, which is. is funded heavily by subsidies by the government. It's called it's called scaminol. How's that? <laughs> scaminol. <laughs> you know, the German <laughs> government tried to force Germans to put it in their cars. And a study showed that it's not good for the engine. And the one thing good about the Germans is they don't want you to mess with their cars. So the government was forced to take it off the market. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, the Germans are the best engineers pretty well in the world. And you do anything that's engineer violates a good common sense in engineering, it's not going to happen. You know, it's funny. is the difference between parking in Italy and parking in Germany. In Italy, you just pull into the car behind you and then into the car in front of you until you squeeze into the spot. In Germany, if you touch a car... You you might find yourself in a heated argument, possibly even a fist fight. Uh huh. But you know, at this point, you know, I, I would encourage people go to LaRouchePack dot com, read what we have on the site about Keisha Rogers' victory, because all we've said about Obama is that this guy is losing his allies, he's losing his mojo, his sense of inevitability. He has to be taken down taken out of the White House, removed from the presidency by legal means before the Democratic Convention at the end of August. That way we can have an actual discussion about what are the needs of the nation and who can represent that. And it might force the Republicans to dump Romney. Romney. Well, I think Romney needs to be dumped. I'd actually like to see Rand Paul, which is Ron Paul's son, switch and actually run, because I know that Ron Paul purports to be pro-life and he's an obstetrician, but he believes the state's rights to, to determine abortion. But Rand Paul, and I've got his emails and reports, he is pro-life. And I would support him for running for president. There's also, we have Tom Hoffling. Uh, we have other candidates that could be out there. We need to deal with the issue of pro-life, number one. Number two, bringing our money back home, building infrastructure. And we need to, what's called terraform our North American continent. I mean, it's the crazy problem, that they, these Dr. sort of pseudo-environmentalists are, are trying to block it. And the whole idea, too, of opening up. The, on the one hand, we have the schizophrenic attitude of Obama. 700 million acres opened up to hydrofracking with toxic chemicals. They don't even have to tell you until they finish. And on the other hand, he blocks the XL pipeline. It's very schizophrenic, the behavior of Obama. He just doesn't make sense. The only thing he enjoys is the kill list, according to the New York Times, of ordering oh a kill of alleged terrorists. You know, one of the things that happened this week, and I'll be very quick with this, but Gary Greenwald in Salon Magazine uh, had a story about how an al-Qaeda terrorist, a supposed al-Qaeda terrorist in Pakistan was killed. The next day, his brother and family were gathered to mourn, and we sent a drone and killed the mourners. That's what al-Qaeda does. That's not what Americans do. We don't kill mourners. We don't kill rescuers who are trying to clean up after a, a drone attack. But Obama does do that, and supposedly he loves it. Yeah, that's really sick. And if the New York Times is putting it out, you can just imagine how much worse it is in reality. <laughs> well, and then, of I'm course, when we have, losing. We, we should we should be thankful at this juncture that we have Mr. Putin and the Chinese standing up to the West to not start a war against Syria and Iran. Uh, and we have some common sense in the Israeli government, including former uh, Israeli officials like Mayor Dagan. Hopefully that won't turn into a big disaster because uh, if it's Obama's call, he'll have it after the election, but they'll give them all they need to let the maniacs start a real thermonuclear war in the Mideast. Amazing. LaRouche, PAC.com, and the phone number again, Harley, is... 